Walkin' Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And, of course, if you are new to the show, uh, lots of other ways to listen, of course, on TuneIn, uh, iTunes, Stitcher. Uh, you can hear me rebroadcast on Friday nights on Awake and uh, Ed Opperman's Spreaker channel and also on Saturdays. Uh, from 6 to 8 on KYAH. But of course, uh, the the main place, if all else fails, always go to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, uh, where all of the shows are archived. Uh, and uh, and if you're there, then uh, maybe maybe click on the donate button as well on AFR and help support us and, and uh, Danny, who uh, tirelessly works behind the scenes producing uh, the shows uh, and also you know, uh, consoling uh, various radio hosts like myself. Um, you know, I had the, the I had to call Danny last night to deal with some uh, some uh, you know uh, insider business uh, sort of stuff going on. There's a lot of craziness in radio, and Danny, of course, helped uh, walk me off the ledge. So, if you uh, can support AFR, please do so. If you want to support me, then you can always go to Patreon.com/slash Pierce Redman, and you can become a subscriber for as little as a dollar a month which, of course, gives you access to the bonus podcast. But enough uh, babbling on. We are joined uh, by our uh, good friend and a a frequent guest now on the show, John Atak, of course, the man behind Let's Sell These People a a Piece of Blue Sky. He is a member of the Open Minds Foundation. Uh, And John is also the author of Opening Minds, The Secret World of Manipulation, Undue Influence, and Brainwashing, which is the book that we are going to be discussing today. But John Atek, how are you? It's good to talk to you. I'm good. It's always good to be here, Piss. Excellent. Um, so uh, as I was saying there, um, you know, we're, we're going to be discussing uh, John's book, Opening Minds. And of course, you know, where, wherever the mood uh, takes us, you know, we, we tend to uh, jump around and, and discuss lots of very interesting topics. But uh, I just quickly um, just kind of wanted to throw this out there, John. And we were sort of talking um, b- before we went uh, live on the air about uh, Scientology.tv, the Scientology Network. Uh, and this just launched last Saturday, uh, I believe at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, coincidentally, I, um, I don't know if you saw this, John. You might have seen it on uh, Tony Ortega's blog, but um, it launched the exact same day that there was um, a documentary about uh, Shelley Miscavige uh, disappearing off the face of the earth. So uh-huh. amazing timing. And, uh, of course, um, you know, everybody – uh, was was trying to log on or, or you know stream Scientology Network, so it kept crashing. But uh, you know, big news: uh, Miss Gavage, chairman of the board, did appear um, in the beginning, uh, looking horrible. I mean, he looks like a wax you know mannequin or something now. But um, John, you're saying you didn't watch any of Scientology TV, did you? Well, I I, I just put it up on the screen actually while while you were. Doing <laughs> yeah, I've, got, I've got it on as well, actually. <laughs> and. Um, Oh, apparently you've got to keep your body clean. That's a yes. piece of advice. I didn't realize that. It, yeah, it's yeah. It's got the way to happiness in it, which, which has got um, things like the way to happiness does not consist of murdering your friends and family, mm. which I thought was probably a little bit of a short statement, you know, that probably the way to happiness doesn't consist of murdering anybody. But, <laughs> yeah, um, right. Friends and family. And you're not meant to tell harmful lies. So who is it is that decides whether they're harmful or not, well, of course, but yeah, um, the way to happiness. There we go. Yeah, oh, it's pre- just pre- said, uh, pre- yeah, pre- preserve your teeth. Yeah. That's a big way. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh wow. Well. And I guess uh, just quickly, just while we're on it, um, just a few things. I sort of mentioned this a little bit, I think, last week. But um, you know, the funny thing about the Scientology Network is that 
Now, there are, like, they have their own sort of, like, documentary series. Um, there's, like, Meet a Scientologist, which is just so boring. Um, but basically, you know, they, they, they pick different people, you know, and try to portray them as sort of normal, you know, every, you know, there's a guy who runs a, um, very successful banjo company. Uh, and I guess he's a Scientologist. Um, you know, again, trying to sort of normalize, uh, everyday people, publics involved in it. But, you know, so much of it is, is basically just ads because, of course, why would Scientology offer you, you know, they're not going to give you, um, like you said earlier, John, there's no such thing as a free personality test. They're not going to actually give you the, the, the secrets to Scientology for free on, online and, and on direct TV apparently as well. Um, no, you, can't, you, you have to go, have to go to WikiLeaks for that. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, interesting, though, they, they do have like um, there's a, a documentary series on L. Ron Hubbard uh, that, that was on earlier. Um, I, I don't believe it's on uh, th- this week. Um, you know, and they've got other things like, you know, they've got some documentary about drugs. They've got Dianetics and introduction. But it seems like for the most part, you know, it, it's really just giving you a little taste. And here's my question to you, John. Is this not just like. I don't know, 10 years too late. Um, I know that for a while there was talk of launching some sort of a media platform for Scientology. I mean, certainly they spent a lot of money buying up uh, production space and whatnot, but this seems sort of like too late. You know, I mean, Leah Remini is about to start another season of her television show. Uh, More and more people are writing books about Scientology, you know, former Scientologists. Uh, and, you know, it just seems like a little bit too late. I mean, what's your take on it? I think you're right that <clears throat> the I, I, I personally think the turning point was South Park. Mm. Um, that when the um, Tom Cruise come out of the closet <laughs> yes. um, episode aired, that that just put a chill out mm. there. Because if you were, you know, in your target groups, with cults are going to be particularly adolescents and people in retirement um, because th- those are times of, of change and vulnerability. You're from an adolescent, you're, you're undergoing neural pruning in your brain. So you can have some pretty weird behavior, but you're also starting to feel infatuation. You're starting to feel you know, more powerful emotional feelings. And if you had the confusion of all of that, so some Scientologist comes along and says, well, hey, you know, we can help you out. I mean, that's what happened to me. I was 19. Mm. Um, that market went with South Park. Mm. And when Anonymous joined in, you know, it, it made it just deeply uncool to be involved yes. with Scientology. So we're seeing internal membership figures of about 25,000. And the thought that this, you know, it's perceived as this huge behemoth. And there may be as few as 25,000 paid up members internationally. Um, so, you know, they're at a very low point. And this look, you know, looking at this thing, which is going on on my other computer to the side of me, <laughs> this has cost money to make. You know, yeah. This is a, a long documentary piece. Some of it filmed outdoors, all properly lit, properly uh, staged. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to put this piece together, which reminds me of, you know, they, they had Hill and Knowlton, the famous mm-hmm. PR agency working for them. At the same time that Hill and Knowlton um, created the lies about um, Kuwait, where they had the uh, Kuwaiti ambassador's 15-year-old daughter saying that she'd seen them pushing the babies out of the incubators in Kuwait City, whereas in fact that day she'd been shopping in New York with her father. <laughs> um and so the same PR agency that did that, bless them, were working for Scientology at the time. The interesting thing is they dropped Scientology as a client. Um, they were quite happy to, you know, malign Saddam Hussein and, and do right. all of that. That was fine. And, they're, they're, you know, it shocked me that there was never any uh, punishment for them having done that, you know, prepared a witness to lie to a congressional committee. That, that's, you know, that's perjury and something should have happened about that. Um, but nonetheless, putting that aside, it, it meant that I got a call from Martin Sorrell, who was the head of WPP, who owned J. Walter Thompson, Ogilvy and Mather, Hand Hill and Knowlton, asking what to do about Scientology. 
this is 25 years ago or something. Mm. And all I could say to him was, you know, run and hide, you know, pay them a right, right. don't do it. I should have charged him for that, really, but um, mm. I'm not clever in that way. <laughs> but, yeah, this is this is this has got some work gone into it. This this piece of stuff here. Oh, definitely, and they're they're like all that quality. They're all. They're, I mean, they're fairly well produced. It's also the you know, it's like the most diverse group of Scientologists I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, um, you know, not that Scientology excludes uh, you know the people um, you know by race, but for the most part, it is a fairly you know white rich. Uh, client base that joins Scientology. Of course, that's changing a bit with the Nation of Islam and their, you know, NOI members taking... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, But, you know, that's really more just about numbers. But aside from that, you know, it's really interesting when you see... Because they're also just the... um, There's constantly the the sort of... um, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've seen a million of these, John, the, like, testimonial videos... Um, there's also lots of that, that like fills a lot of the time on Scientology TV. Um, and of course they're not the sort of like hyper manic, um, uh, testimonial videos that you can see like online. Um, not Tom Cruise on the sofa then. No, and not people sort of talking, um, you know, to, 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 and then we'll get to your book to take a, a, a phrase from your book using a lot of loaded language. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, they're not like that. And of course they're, they're, you know, you see black, white, uh, Hispanic, Asian, you know, young, old men, you know, it's like the whole gamut during these videos. And of course it's like, you know, that is, is PR in and of itself. I mean, that's not really representative of Scientology. So yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, I, I can only imagine that the only people watching this right now are Scientologists. Um, and, and you and me, of course. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And maybe a few other, you know, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, our, our mutual friend Jeffrey Augustine has probably seen quite a bit of uh, Scientology TV uh, and others. But, yeah, it, it's just an odd thing. And um, uh, I can only imagine that David Miscavige is probably going to be pretty upset when he starts seeing, you know, the numbers coming in uh, as to who's actually tuning into this and watching. Um, yeah, and, and, and it may you may have viewers. It's just a matter of whether it has any followers you know whether anybody mm. does anything about it but um i don't know it looks it looks pretty slick um, it does look very slick yeah apparently we're all going to be I, I also know there's a, a guy with piercings in it and i don't remember ever seeing anybody <laughs> with piercings in yes i just thought yeah he's got like a nose ring and yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh. no that's, that's what i mean it's a really it's a it's interesting to see that you know and again this is like scientology is like uh you know we're hip to uh, what's going on in the world and, uh, you know, all sorts of all walks of life involved. But of course, I mean, it's, you know, making the able more able. Um, they're not looking for people, uh, you know, without money and, and, and influence and stuff. That is uh, predominantly the, the sort of, uh, you know, power base that they're looking into. But enough about Scientology TV. Um, let's, yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, to the real reason that I wanted to have uh, John back on the show, and that is to discuss his excellent book, uh, Opening Minds, The Secret World of Manipulation, Undue Influence, and Brainwashing. Uh, of course, there will be a link uh, to buy the book in the show notes for this. You can get it on Kindle for uh, as little as uh, $7.99, and uh, paperback, it's only uh, $17, so very affordable. I uh, highly recommend people uh, check it out. It is a, a fascinating uh, read, um, it, and it, it's very, you know, um, this is something I wanted to, to kind of open with here, John. I mean, it, it's a very different book in terms of, uh, you know, the way that you discuss um, undue influence and things. And, you know, it, it's not um, the sort of like typical book on like cults or, or brainwashing or mind control or whatever you want to, you know, whatever yeah. kind of term you want to use. And I kind of wanted to ask you, you know, um, you know, why did you decide to write the book and, and why did you decide to write it in the way that you have? Because it's it's uh, it really is very much a book about um, how the mind works, you know, beyond just, say, uh, the influence that, um, you know, a Scientologist can have on you uh, or, or really any cult leader. And, in, and indeed, you you don't um, you know, you don't go into depth about any cult, you know, in, in all that much, you know, all that much. I mean, a lot of the book talks about um 
you know, the, the sort of uh, like totalitarian uh, groups like the Nazis or the Soviet Union or uh, China under Mao. Um, and, and then also just down to a very personal level, um, you know, I really loved uh, the chapter where you, you talk about, um, you know, coercive control and, uh, you know, especially the way that men tend to, um, you know, be more, I guess, uh, adapt at uh, coercing and controlling uh, their significant others. So anyway, John, tell us a little bit, why did you decide to write Opening Minds and, and why did you decide to write it in this way? Well, it, it goes back a long way for me. And, you know, I left Scientology in 1983 um, and I spent six or seven years researching that, finding out about Ron Hubbard, finding out about the history of the group, um, interviewing, talking with, reading testimony by about 150 people to put together that. But at the same, you know, towards the end of that period, I was more and more interested in, you know, what has attracted us? Why had we become involved? Um, I knew a NASA physicist um, who was, you know, on a course I was on. I, I knew journalists. I knew um, a sociologist. Um, I knew eight medical doctors in the UK alone. Um, Earl Cooley, who was a, a top trial lawyer in the Boston area, joined up and went went through it all. So the question in my mind was, why were bright people, educated people, uh, taken in by this? Um, why didn't their critical thinking skills protect them? And so I started reading everything I could get my hands on back in the late 80s. Um, Conway and Siegelman's Snapping was about the first textbook I read. Um, and they put forward this idea of sudden personality change in conversion, which does sometimes happen to people. Um, though more often there's a gradual change in, in my experience of Scientology. Um, I read uh, Battle for the Mind by William Sargent, which is a 1950s book digging into you know, brainwashing. I went on to Robert J. Lifton's remarkable work and then on to Cialdini's book about influence, uh, Zimbardo's books. I wanted to understand the social psychology. Why are we vulnerable? When are we vulnerable? And as I looked at that, it, it also became, it become apparent to me that, the, you know, this term cult group is, it's handy, but it, it mm -hmm. doesn't really define anything. It, it, you know, as, as I said in the last show, being called a, a former Scientologist is like being called a former idiot. Yeah, 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 exactly. There's a social presumption that if you're in mm. a cult group, you are an idiot, you're gullible. Mm. And that was certainly not my experience. And, you know, we could add in here that, in fact, uh, Isaac Newton belonged to a cult group, that Michael Faraday belonged to a cult group, just if we want to, <clears throat> excuse me, get the level of intellect that could be involved. Newton was a Unitarian, which, which he could have been uh, capitally punished for. Uh, in the 17th century, it was uh, not allowed. And Michael Faraday was a Sandemanian. Um, mm. it, there is something much bigger going on here. And the first part of that is we're all involved in a cult. The human race is a cult. The human, you know, when you look at human practices all around the world, people do awful things. I wanted to understand what's that group dynamic. Now, as a teenager, I had two questions of the world. The first was, how could Jack the Ripper have done what he did? You know, these awful um, attacks upon these, these women. Uh, how could anybody do that? And the other question was, how was it that in 1938, the Austrians, the Sudetenland Germans and the Germans all voted, well, 98% of them, to not be allowed to vote anymore? H how did they give themselves to this man who was quite obviously not a six foot tall, blonde, blue eyed, <laughs> Harry, you know, mm. and yeah, you know, when you look at him in performance, he, he does look quite mad. You know, look at the footage of him in Triumph of the Will, for example. And, uh, you know, how is that? How, how could people do that and then go to war and do the atrocious things that the Nazis did? Um, and that's out of belief. And belief became my interest. So I looked at how people remain in abusive situations 
And that stretched way beyond the many groups we call cults, which are business cults, therapy cults, religious cults, marketing cults. There are all sorts of groups out there. I started looking at gangs and reading about gangs. I read a great deal about terrorism, and it seemed to me, you know, as, as you see in the book, there's a chapter on the radicalization um, of, of a young English Muslim, um, mm-hmm. a young privileged English Muslim who'd you know, gone to private school and got to university and not been in a particularly religious family, and he was recruited. Um, and I went through his recruitment and sort of went, well, these are the stages that we talk about in the counter-cult world, uh, the eight points of Robert J. Lifton's thought reform program. All of these things have happened here. And so it seemed to me that, and then again, I, I, it was something that it, it's an essential thought that there is a, a social psychology that is normal to us. Um, there are questions at the moment, again, about uh, Stanley Milgram's work that uh, maybe his results and probably his results were too pessimistic, that far more people resisted him than his book shows. Um, there's recently been a piece in New Scientist uh, published by a, a scholar from Melbourne who went through all of the recordings, all of the sessions in the Milgram Yale experiments, the shock machine experiments, were recorded. And she went through them and said, well, actually, his numbers come from the first 40 people, not from the whole experiment. So this idea that 65% of people will do whatever you tell them. Mm. And he didn't record the many times that people said, I don't want to do this. So we're not quite as bad as as that makes us seem, but we are pretty bad. <laughs> um, we had an incident in Nottingham, where I lived last week, where an 18-year-old Egyptian girl was chased by a pack of girls through the city and onto a, a, a bus and beaten to death. And like Kitty Genovese, nobody seems to have done anything about it. So... I think of that as a kind of herd behavior, the swarm behavior, which is in us all, probably. Um, Mm. 98% of German speakers voted not to be allowed to vote. Um, Where indeed, you know, only what, 32% or something could voted for Hitler in the first place. Um, Just what four or five years before, five years before. Um, This sort of herd mentality, this looking to the bellwether, looking to the leader to see what to do. It's a part of of who we are, and it's something we need to not be. It's something we need to overcome. So you've got all that group behavior that's, or swarm behavior or herd behavior, that's quite natural. But then you have ways of amplifying it, and, and that is thought reform. That is where you very specifically tinker with somebody's um, responses. So, for example, I have a chapter about um, recruitment and seduction in Opening Minds, um, showing the way that, and here they are again, the Scientologists do it, which is you find somebody, you approach them, and once you've got some rapport with them by agreeing with something or other that they say, or you know, saying your views are like their views or what have you, once you've got some rapport, you then start pushing them down I must say, I never did this. I was trained to do it, but I didn't like the idea of it, so I didn't do it. But you're meant to find what's ruining that person's life. And you then push them down further into the idea that that they won't be able to resolve it. And you then offer them Scientology. Mm. And this kind of unscrupulous way of, you know, diving into the horrors of somebody's life and saying, you know, we can we can deal with that, you are making somebody emotionally vulnerable. If you then add to this, this, you know, we're going to sometime soon bring my friend Yuval Laor on. He's been working on the emotional attachment that we have to groups, uh, which can be positive, but the way that, that awe and fervor developing people which is of course the answer to that question of why so many germans voted that they were taken up in this um grandiose scheme you know whereby 
Germany would become the thousand year, year Reich, the thousand year Reich. Um, and they somehow bought into that. <laughs> and it seems impossible looking back. But in fact, when you look to surveys that were done in the late 1940s in Germany and not published, more than 50% of Germans still believed in Hitler after the war. You know, this, so you, you get some idea and you push it into a culture and you then maintain it. I'm fascinated by that. One of the essential aspects of that is the feeling of certainty. Why do we feel sure of things? You know, why do we have this sense of knowing that so often when we actually consider our opinions, their preferences, their tastes, they're not really, you know, the way, the truth and the life. I again and again tell the story of a, of, um, a born again Christian who tried to convert me when I was about 17. And after two hours of very frustrating conversation, and, and you know how frustrating it can be to talk to me, Piers. <laughs> after two hours of very frustrating conversation about Jesus and this kind of stuff, he backed away from me and he walked backwards. He, he kept his eye on me just in case I bit him. And I wasn't being unpleasant. I was just curious. You know, I, I like I like logical debates. It, it mm. interests me. So, you know, but after two hours, he couldn't take any more. And he walked away and he said, I don't understand the Bible, but I know it's all true. Mm. And that's the gap where certainty falls, that, that we need to be um, a little more careful about you know, what we are certain of. Um, so bringing those things together, saying, well, this is something that's throughout human society. We, we don't teach our children to disagree. We, we don't teach our children to say, hang on a minute, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, my old friend Ira Chalef, um wrote a wonderful book called Intelligent Disobedience, which we promote as much as we can at Open Minds. And he put up a, a little video, uh, which if you put uh, blink, think, choice, voice into your browser, you'll come up with this wonderful little five minute video, which has been prepared for five year olds. To say, if you know somebody says something that doesn't sound right, then blink, think about what they've said, make the choice of whether you're going to do anything about it, and then say, that doesn't make sense to me, or could you explain that, or I don't think that's right. Mm. Our problem has been this almost militaristic sense of obedience that you know our universal universal schooling was first devised by the Prussians after Napoleon beat them and they decided all the children would have to go to school so that they could be trained into obedient warriors and I think that's still in there there's still this idea of you know evil in human beings they've got to be controlled mm. and what we see is that in fact the most academically successful schools don't do that they do want you to think they do want you to ask questions and I fear that you know, an obedient society is not a creative society. Um, you know, of course, in the military or the police or times of emergency, we need somebody in charge and we need to do things in a coordinated way. But in most human situations, there is time to think. And some very seriously bad choices have been made in the last decades politically, um, leading to wars and environmental catastrophe, which are in a, a more thinking population, you know, might not have happened. So mm. that became essential to me. And I, I want to share with people some of the underlying principles of uh, social psychology, which makes sense. You know, they're very simple. Uh, an idea, say, like confirmation bias, that we tend to agree with things that we agree with. And we tend to push away things that we don't agree with. So if somebody you know, tells us that some opinion of ours is, is valuable and wonderful, then we'll accept that. But if somebody disagrees, somebody says, you know, well, I don't believe what you believe, we put up a wall immediately. And, you know, teaching people that, that it's really in their interests to actually calm down, not attach anything emotionally, listen to what's being said, and and go away and think about it, rather than you know, pushing our own point of view. I mean, 
this can get pretty crazy. And I sat through some very long spiels about, you know, conspiracy theories that made absolutely no sense to me in, in the attempts to, you know, listen to people. So sometimes, you know, there's no way you can go with that. But I, I think obedience is, is not good for us. Um, collaboration is, cooperation is. You know, I think, again, we have too much competition in our society, you know, based on the kind of Conrad Lorenz notion that we're all really aggressive and so you can only teach people that way, which, of course, isn't true. You know, it's it's one aspect of our humanity that we can be aggressive, but obviously we can also be highly collaborative. Mm. And I think, you know, I think that's easier if you, if we could get it over to our kids. I mean, open minds, the, the idea is to really appeal to bright adolescents. And at the moment, our website is accessible to them. It's something they can read, but we need, need to add things that will attract them. Um, because that's the point where most transformation takes place you know you're in your teens your brain is doing what it's doing and you will you know for almost everybody you'll develop the ideology that you will follow for life somewhere in your adolescence mm. uh, well that that reminds me john of um you're talking there about adolescence and obedience and all that stuff and you uh you you talk about in uh in opening minds in the book the um, Louise Ogborn uh, incident or the, the strip search case um, yep. where, and this is, I, I think some people will probably have heard of this before. I, I sort of vaguely remembered it. And then when I was reading it, it all kind of came rushing back to me, but this is like, it seems almost impossible. It seems far fetched. Like it seems like only something that would happen in a movie or, or, you know, the, the, that this woman, Louise Ogborn, was just like an idiot or something. But uh, this is like the, the is like a classic example of uh, of a, or a terrifying example of our obedience to authority. And talk a little bit about this, because this is and this is not an isolated incident. Um, this uh, this happened like 70 times in different places. And just explain what the what happened to Louise Ogborn and why this is such a, a sort of an interesting case study to look at in obedience. Yeah, um, there, there's a, a, a movie uh, called Compliance. In fact, there are two movies about it, um, which pretty much goes through it. And um it was at a McDonald's in um, Kentucky. Matt Washington, yeah. in Kentucky. Louise Ogborn was 18 years old. You know, it was a, she was a high school graduate. And, um, you know, she just, she wanted to study pre-med at college. And so she was going to do this job. About 5 p.m. Um, one afternoon, the assistant manager took a call from this guy who claimed to be Officer Scott. And he persuaded her that one of her assistants had um, taken money from somebody's purse. And uh, he, he didn't, you know, he did a bit of cold reading. He basically got her to describe the assistant so that he could say, oh, yeah, it'll be that one. Mm. He then persuaded them to take Louise Ogborn into the back room and stayed on the phone um, while... She was basically humiliated. Um, she was told to strip naked, uh, to be searched, um, you know, basically ended up performing a sexual act with, with a man who was later sent to prison for this. Mm. Um, and this guy, as you say, he, he'd done this over 70 times. Um, the horror is that, that they were never able to... Um, get him to court because uh, they couldn't prove. And, and you're in this bizarre situation where this guy, you know, what is it he's done wrong? I mean, he's pretended to be a police officer, but the compliance is all on the end of the people in the McDonald's. And he reckoned, I think he'd made 11 calls that day already. And he'd just keep calling one fast food place after another until he got one that would bite. And just this notion that he was a police officer was enough for them to, you know, take her clothes away from her and humiliate her. Um, and it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. 
and it, and it ended up with McDonald's having to pay her a, quite a large, what was it, uh, $1.1 million as a settlement. Mm. They also had to pay $400,000 to the assistant manager for the trauma that she'd been put through, which I'm... Yeah, it's quite which is insane. And, you know, that assistant manager was, I mean, uh, you know, at one point, uh, the assistant manager uh, sent her then-husband in there, and then the her husband fiance, was on the phone. Yeah. Or fiancé, excuse me, yeah, her fiancé. And, you know, once this man comes on the phone, that's when, I mean, the torture sort of is uh, increased and he, uh, you know, slaps uh, Louise Ogborn so hard, um, you know, on her butt that she's red welts. He then has her perform uh, a sex act on him. Um, and at one point, I mean, this woman, her, you know, his, his fiance, she walks in and just ignores her um, while she's screaming for help. Uh, and yeah, I know. And, and she, um, you know, she got a settlement because she was a victim as well. Um, you know, and one of the fascinating things about this case, John A, is that you could, you know, you might say, oh, that would never happen. Well, he he managed to do it 70 times Yep. with, with nothing more than saying I'm Officer Scott or Officer Phil or whatever. I'm sure he changed yep. the name, but that's about it. The, you know, the other scary thing is, I mean, it, if a real cop came in, would any, you know, I mean, again, nobody would bat an eye. Nice. Um, and in fact, you could probably, a real cop could probably do that and it wouldn't even be illegal. Um, well, you know, it's into a very strange territory, aren't we? I mean, hmm. one of the things that fascinates me is that the guy who actually called an end to it was a maintenance man who was right. asked to take over babysitting. And this guy had something like an eighth grade education. But he looked at this and said, you guys are crazy. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And it, I think it says something about the amount of compliance obedience that's built into education well you know the authority that tells me to do it cops telling me to do it so it must be okay and you know yes it's an incredibly scary thought and it brings us to the, the vulnerability that we all have that uh the people who say well that could never happen to me are in fact the people it's easiest to do this to that's my experience so you know i used to recruit for a cult <laughs> and the, the the people I found easy were the people who who told me how crazy what I believed was, and you know they'd never fall for it. And I'd have them, you know, within a week they'd be sitting in a Scientology course room. Uh, mm. you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that everybody I got in left, but, uh, <laughs> and a few thousand more, I hope. <laughs> but what uh, that that sort of notion too um again that uh, you know the, the people that are receiving more education perhaps or the people that we perceive as being quote unquote smarter mm -hmm. um you know are in many ways more susceptible to this i mean that also is um i mean there's some truth to that as well with um uh you know like hypnotism mm -hmm. um and again that's a big big section of your book <clears throat> excuse me is talking uh, you know about the sort of different um, types of hypnotic or altered states. And again, the, even the word hypnotism is sort of like cult is kind of um, not maybe not the most appropriate word, but it's sort of like the word that we kind of use for all of that. It's but become, again, um, become a very loaded word. And, mm. and I, I tend publicly to talk about guided imagination because people understand what that means and that you can do it without realizing that it's a synonym for hypnosis. Mm hmm. So when you do a visualization, for example, well, that's guided imagination, that's hypnosis. But the the word hypnosis has become, you know, so fraught with um, the Bengali. You know, yeah. the, you, you say that the man with the, the the pocket watch and the and the goatee. Yeah, exactly. Trilby in in uh, Bengali in in the novel Trilby, um, and it, it, it often the word gets in the way. Um, because we have, you know, I, I talk in the book about purr words and snarl words and democracy is a purr word and fascism is a snarl word. Um, appeasement, which is uh, actually a perfectly positive word, if you look it up, will now be spat out. Uh, you know, appeasement means negotiating a settlement. But mm. it has come now to refer to Chamberlain's deal with Hitler. 
right. uh, 1938. And, and as soon as you're willing to talk to somebody rather than kill them, that's appeasement, you know. Mm. Well, so it's if, like the, the Iran deal here, you know, the, this, um, uh, you know, God forbid we ever uh, decide to talk to a, to a hostile nation. You know, that, that, the, the same thing. We, we've appeased the evil Iranians in America. Um, you know, this is a, uh, this is evil. This is a bad thing. I mean, it's the same sort of rhetoric we hear, hear constantly. Yeah. And, it, and of course, you know, in that particular instance, we might have an admission of guilt about deposing the democratically elected <laughs> president of Iran in what was it, 1953 mm. and replacing him with a dictator. And I think that lack of a sense of history is very important that that um, when Tony Blair was talking about the Middle East and saying, you know, we just have to draw a line and move on. That's very easy to do if your grandparents weren't killed, you know, <laughs> but, you know, you, you can't do that with other people. You've, you've got to have a kind of truth and reconciliation and say, you, you know, this is what happened. This is what we did. And even occasionally, I'm sorry, you know, mm -hmm. um, and maybe one day the U S Congress will admit that there was a, um, a genocide of Armenians in Turkey, but mm. when when they uh, when they said they were going to vote on that uh, decades ago, the Turks said, "Well, you can take all your missiles out of Turkey if you do that." International politics is a remarkable situation, and I I think that to you know the the current war between Christendom and Islam, which has roused itself up again. Uh, needs to, you know, people need to look at some history and some facts. So, so yeah, the Iranians are uh, civilized, sophisticated people. Um, they have some of the uh, most advanced cloning labs in the world. They have a lot of trained scientists. They're not some, you know, ignorant rabble, mm. you know, of the imagination. They're real people, and. Um, they are not necessarily supporters of the Ayatollahs, but quite a lot of them aren't. Um, but there's a perception, isn't there? You know, I, I mean, I, when the first Iraq invasion happened, I, I happened to be in the US and I was in Bishop, California. And I used to smoke then and I went into a, a store to, to buy a, a carton of cigarettes and... Um, the guy behind the counter is very large and there was a shotgun on the wall behind him. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to fight with him. He said, uh, what do you think about this stuff in Iraq? And I was kind of trying to think of something. Fortunately, I got somebody a bit more clever than I am with me, a journalist <laughs> who was able to say something completely neutral. And uh, his response was, I think we should bomb those mm. fuckers flat. You know, and it, and you sort of go, this is the cradle of civilization. This is, you know, this is the top between the Tigris and the Euphrates. This is where Sumer and Babylon were. This is where the Jewish people came from, from the city of Ur. Um, why do you want to annihilate these people? You know, mm. and it 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 is about confirmation bias. It's about being unwilling to consider other points of view and believing in abstractions like nation, you know, um, the patriotism, this notion that, you know, I love my country. Well, what is your country? You know, well, apart from the immigrants, I love my country. Well, apart from, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, this, that, and the other, I love my country. And it, it's that sense of, certainty that, that goes with that that you know i you know my my country wrong or right whereas of course countries are, are an invention of the 19th century where nation was no longer a matter of the king says you've got to go and kill people now you went and did it because you believed in your nation well mm. you know the king was still in charge still in his counting house and you know you weren't getting anything but garibaldi got italy together and uh, the Prussians pulled Germany together in 1891. And we got this idea of nation and this loyalty to a nation as if there was such a thing as being Scottish or Welsh or, you know, as distinct. And these, all of these human groupings are to some extent cults. Mm. Now, 
where they maintain traditions, um, you know, they're friendly and creative, fantastic. You know, uh, we uh, celebrate Diwani, the Hindu festival of light in, in Leicester, just up the road from here, because we have quite a large Hindu population. I love that, I, that, that we're sharing those things and the foods we eat and what have you. But when it becomes isolating me as a human being from, from other people and saying, well, you're a Muslim, you know, how dare you be a Muslim? And you then began, well, what do you know about what Muslims actually believe? And what do you know about the very peaceful uh, face of m most of Islam? You know, people are, they, you know, they want to believe everybody's a Salafi terrorist. And so in the U.S. you get the situation where, what is it, 80 percent of Arabs in the U.S. are actually Christians, but they're still being persecuted for being Arab because hey, they're Arabs, and Arabs are Muslims. And well, and, and every every rural uh, community uh, is terrified that, you know, Sharia law is going to, to come in. I mean, again, it, it's it's so, it just, it, there's not a single chance, there's not a, you know, the, the slightest chance that it's ever going to happen here. Uh, but again, that becomes sort of accepted as fact. Uh, everyone believes that Sharia law is, is going, you know, it's going to happen any moment, John, if we're not careful. Um, yeah, you know, if, if we if we even let our guard down for a little bit, uh, you know, yeah, they're going to come in. I mean, the same way, of course. Yeah, that, you know, I mean, Arab, you can be, um, you know, I, I hate to break it to some of the people out there, but, you know, Arabs are uh, also Christian. They're also Jewish, um, you know, um, they're, or they're secular or, you know, I mean, it, it's just a. Uh, um, or, or I mean, there's, there's a whole multitude of uh, faiths there, uh, but yeah, of course. I mean, that they all get lumped uh, lumped in, and and um, uh, and again creates that that sort of like uh, you know this sort of like cult of of like national identity. Um, you know, uh, you know, God forbid there there be a, you know a Hindu festival in England or, uh, or you know or, or any of these other things. I mean, they don't exist. Um, jumping back a little bit because I, I did want to. This whole and I think some of this, too, is also like part of the, you know, type of, you know, hypnotic or altered state. But going back a little bit to the, the whole issue of, of hypnotism and and how it exists and stuff like that. I, I mean, uh, and again, also kind of getting past the, the sort of it's a difficult term to use. But explain a little bit more about the, this sort of, um, you know, uh, how you describe it in the book, um, because it, it it is something, too, that I think. Um, you know, people people don't even think of things like like uh, you know you, you lay out as one of the things alterations of time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, past life experience, you know, those things. That's a type of hypnotic altered state, but people wouldn't necessarily associate that with the you know quote unquote hypnotism that we've come to know and love. No, and um, I mean we talk about age regression and age progression. Mm-hmm. Um, with hypnotism and let, let me make it clear that, that I have no training as a hypnotist um, because when I left Scientology I realized that I've been highly trained as a hypnotist <laughs> and it it made my stomach turn to realize that techniques that I'd been taught which I believed were um, a benefit to people were actually control techniques now and you get a you can get a conflict there. So, for example, I had a guy who was a classical guitarist. He was just starting out, and he got very nervous before performances. And I did a four-minute um, Scientology procedure on him called a locational, where you just point at things and say, "Look at that." Knowledge that the person's looked at it, maybe touch that. Knowledge that they've touched it. Four minutes later, the guy was fine. Uh, he went to the concert with no nerves. He talked to me some months later and said he never had nerves again. And so there you see a Scientology procedure that was effective in achieving something. Isn't that great? Well, yeah, you know, people wouldn't do it if there wasn't some kind of result. The problem is that what was done was done below the awareness of the person it was being done to. That he didn't really realize what was going on um, and so you're kind of furthering I mean, Ron Hubbard one of the things that attracted me in in his first book Dynetics he said we don't use hypno hypnosis because people are already hypnotized mm -hmm. and that seemed true to me 
And, you know, and I, I didn't get that it was a double bind, that I was actually going to be taught all sorts of hypnotic tricks. <laughs> right, right. Uh, indeed, Hubbard himself cancelled one of the, the, the procedure that was used in that first book, Dianetics, a year later because it was hypnotic. And then it was reintroduced in 1977 with no mention of that. Um, hypnosis, it's such a dangerous term. You have what is called deep trance hypnosis. And this is the stage, you know, hypnotist who gets people to pretend they're chickens or what have you. Um, this is a very interesting phenomenon, but it's not particularly relevant to um, recruitment or seduction into an abusive or toxic group or relationship. Um, it, it used to be very occasional. You then have what's called a light trans hypnosis, which is the form that's more likely to be used by a hypnotherapist and the form that you'll find indeed in Scientology, where you direct the person's attention, you direct their imagination. Um, part of that can be age regression. There's been a lot of work looking at, you know, if you hypnotize somebody, you get them to tell you about their eighth birthday party, then they'll start talking in a voice like this. Mm -hmm. And works shows that their memory won't necessarily be accurate to their eighth birthday party, I'm afraid. Hypnosis is not an accurate way of uncovering memories. Um, it can sometimes be helpful, but it's not accurate. Um, but the voice is how you imagine you should sound. So... There's this kind of strange state that a person goes into where they're very open to suggestions, to commands. Um, indeed, in Scientology, all of the questions that you ask during the counselling process are called commands, which I think uh, is truthful. And indeed, the state <laughs> that you enter in Dianetics in the first book, he talks about you going into reverie, which is another term for light trance, long used by, by hypnotists. A kind of daydreaming state where you know things can be moved around that happens all the time however in a state called priming and uh do you know darren brown's work oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah darren brown did a, a wonderful demonstration of priming where he got to um graphic designers and, and he asked them to design a poster for a pet cemetery and um, he showed you the taxi ride they went on to the studio they did their design and then he went to the corner of the room and lifted up a sheet from an easel to show them that he'd already drawn their design before they they arrived and uh, he'd pretty much got on it what what they used and he then in a rare moment, showed you the visual images they'd been exposed to on their taxi ride and on their way up into the studio, and they'd seen all of the images they used. And this is a part of our creativity and well worth knowing about, that we kind of riff on the stuff that's, you know, come into our heads in the last few minutes. Mm -hmm. you know, we tend to do this. Now, if you're the person pri doing the priming, and uh, hypnotherapists will use priming as a technique. And then, let me say again, I'm not a trained hypnotist, I'm not a hypnotherapist, and I'm not advocating uh, hypnosis or hypnotherapy. Um, but if you've been primed to get to a certain place, you'll see salesmen doing this. You'll see them, you know, getting the right thoughts into your head. If you look at the theory of positioning in advertising, this idea of, you know, you put, you, you position yourself next to the market leader, you position yourself next to the product. This is something that some people do quite naturally and smoothly. It's something that confidence tricksters do with great dexterity, that they will um, induce. Oh. We're, we're coming up on the break right now, but we will uh, be uh, uh, returning with our good friend John Atak in the second hour to talk more about his uh, book, Opening Minds. So please stay tuned.
narcotics. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much. Radio. They're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our stringent quality controls and absolute zero GMOs plus testing for heavy metals makes us unique in the storable foods market. Our line of fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Take out the amount you need and reseal the package for use within the next six months. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's www.simplycleanfoods.net today. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high fructose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company, which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. I don't like words that hide the truth. I don't like words that conceal reality. I don't like euphemisms. And American English is loaded with euphemisms because Americans have a lot of trouble dealing with reality. Americans have trouble facing the truth. So they invent the kind of a soft language to protect themselves from it. I'll give you an example of that. When I was a little kid, if I got sick, they wanted me to go to the hospital and see the doctor. Now they want me to go to a health maintenance organization. Smug, greedy, well-fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore. They neutralize people. The government doesn't lie and engages in disinformation. Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? They never mention that part of it to us, do they? Never mention that part of it. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom, and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs, and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Lead control with the all out. Mind to experience American Freedom Radio. Walking Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything geopolitics. Culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman.
Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. Uh, if you are joining us uh, here in the second hour, we have been speaking with our good friend and frequent guest, John Atak. John, of course, is uh, the uh, author of several books, including Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, as well as Opening Minds, The Secret World of Manipulation, Undue Influence, and Brainwashing, which is a book that we have been uh, most recently discussing. And John is, of course, uh, on the review board chairperson and managing editor of the Open Minds Foundation. Uh, and you can find out a whole lot more about uh, Open Minds and um, what they're up to by going to openmindsfoundation.org. And, of course, that will be linked up in the show notes. Um, John, we were uh, before we uh, sorry, I had to take a break there with the commercial. Um, we were talking a little a little bit about, you know, hypnotism and uh, hypnotic and altered states, and we were talking about priming, and you were you were starting to kind of talk about um, you know how uh, salesmen, how salespeople, uh, sort of use this, and that is again a, a um, in a lot of ways, you know that that's one of these instances where we're very susceptible to hypnosis, um, you know, in, in a much more um, you know kind of everyday level. So finish your thought about that a little bit. What were you you know you were you were talking about. Um, you know, like the, the where the salesperson might stand, who they're going to talk to, all that. So explain a little bit more about that. Hmm. I mean, I, mean, I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend um, Bob Cialdini's um, book, Influence. I think everybody should read it. It's been a, a university textbook for 30 years now. And um, I sometimes wonder, I think, you know, uh, our system of education is such that people read this stuff, pass an exam, and then forget all about it. You know, I, I really do worry. I've, I've interviewed, you know, psychology graduates who don't seem to have really understood the material they studied. And, um, you know, this is really useful stuff. You can actually find there's um, a little whiteboarding video of the six original points of influence that Cialdini put up. So, for example, scarcity, the principle of, well, you buy now because there aren't many left and tomorrow it's going up in price and what have you. Um, reciprocity, that if um, I give you something for free, you know, a, a lost leader, a, a free pack of soap or what have you, then there will be, for many people, the feeling they should give something back. I um, you know, I talk about the Hare Krishnas we used to see on the streets back in the day. Isn't it refreshing, the Krishnas, the Moonies, and to some extent, the Scientologists, the children of God, the, the cults that dominated the 70s and the 80s are almost extinct in the Western world. Unfortunately, we've got Stephen Molyneux. And <laughs> um, you did say that we, we ought to say something bad about him, didn't you? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. No, please. Let's, uh, well, it's funny you, you're just mentioning. I mean, there is um, very close to where I work. There is a small Hare Krishna I don't even know. I mean, it's like a storefront, really. Um, but, uh, you know, so I do see, you know, Hare Krishna's around periodically. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, those, the, I mean, the Moonies are, I mean, they still exist. Um, but uh, well, they, they exist in a big way, but they exist in South Korea and Japan. They mm, seem, mm. you know, apart from the gun factory in Philadelphia, of course, and <laughs> the tuna fishing fleets. And is it the Washington Star that they own, the newspaper? Oh, they, um, I don't know the Washington Times. I believe they they, they uh, still own that. I'm not entirely yeah. sure. But it, but again, with the Krishnas, it, there used to be a presence at most airports. Yes. Um, I haven't see, actually seen a Krishna on the streets in the UK in about 15 years now, and uh, that's a very confusing organisation because I, I think uh, Prabhupada was perfectly genuine. He was an Indian guru. He'd Lived his work, lived his working life as a chemist, and then retired and wanted to teach a, the devotional form of Hinduism. And it's not consistent with the Western way of life: sleeping four hours a night, having to have a written permission to have sex with your wife. These are things that don't go down well with us, particularly. Um, but it's an interesting thing that, that you know, one man's religion is another man's cult. That when you move the thing from one society to another, it looks extraordinarily strange. Um, returning to the, the notion of salesmen, there are so many tricks. Uh, for example, the emotional seesaw. 
uh, which I don't talk about in the book. So this is a this is a free gift. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's not all. Um, this is the technique is called uh, the emotional seesaw, which is where you basically offer something and then withdraw it. You say, oh, no, I, I won't be able to do that. You know, and then you go, oh, well, I'll go and see my manager. And you, you know, go out and smoke a cigarette and come back in and say, right. yeah, the manager says you can have the deal. This the emotional manipulations that go on, if you then move that into abusive relationships, um, that was you know, something I came to late in the day. We have a, a wonderful psychiatrist, a, a man called Nick Child, retired psychiatrist, who spent his life working with, with families and particularly with child alienation. Um, you know, where a, a child has been stopped from talking, you know, one parent has put the other parent down and so that parent is not involved. Now, dealing with Nick made me think more and more about individual relationships and, you know, how um, predatory men and occasionally predatory women will control another person in a, um, a family household setting. And that this is really a cult group at its smallest level, mm. where you have an individual who demands that they are in charge and whatever they want to happen is what will happen. And they will cow uh, their partner into becoming a slave, pretty much. And when you look at the, you know, the horrors of the, the larger cults, the, you know, the terrible way that people are treated um, in the inner groups of groups like the Moonies or the Scientologists, you're seeing that abusive relationship. And there's a piece of psychology there that's very interesting. Um, my friend Alex Stain, who I think I mentioned before, wrote a book called Terror, Love and Brainwashing, which is in part about her experiences in a, a socialist cult in Minnesota. Um, but she she's a social psychologist now, and she talks about attachment. And I think attachment is a, an astonishingly straightforward and useful concept that attachment theory, which grew up in the 1950s and 60s, basically said, well, you can have a secure attachment as a child to your caregivers. You can have a dismissive attachment where you're put down no matter what you do. Um, and you can have an avoidant attachment where you're just ignored. And then you can have a mix of the three. Now, a secure attachment would be a, a supportive and accepting attachment. And it's an interesting way to estimate people. Are they dismissive? Are they avoidant? Or do they feel secure? And in cult groups, you get this fourth type of attachment, which is called a disorganized attachment, which you will also find in families, where the person who is meant to be the person who's securely attached to, who's meant to be the source of comfort and support, um, becomes the predator. So um, Alex argues that for, you know, the, the total convert, um, you will have somebody who depends upon the cult leader or indeed the abusive partner for their opinions. Um, but they depend upon them for love and comfort. And th it'll be the kind of parent who says, oh, come here, come here, I love you, and then slaps the child. You know, And that disorganized attachment seems to really do something awful with our heads, that, that we keep going back for more. You know, I've been in relationships with um, a borderline or two over the years. And you have this wonderful... You know, you're being told how saintly and lovely you are one minute, and then the next de next minute you're the devil. Hmm. And that creates a disorganized attachment where you're always wondering what it is that you did wrong, rather than identifying the problem directly and saying, this person has a problem. You know, you know they, they need to change their way of communicating, their way of being. Um, so, so I think attachment theory is it's a very interesting way to look at it, to say, you know, what are my relationships with people? Am I dismissive? Am I avoidant? Um, do I, I mean, I'm, am I supportive? You know, and hopefully supportive towards good things, not bad things. Um, 
you know, as a father, I have four children. Um, and so, you know, I'm very aware of, of how important it is to encourage people that um, my friend Rachel Bernstein, who's a counselor in uh, Los Angeles, um, and if anybody has a cult problem there and needs some help to recover, she's a f- good person to go to, Rachel Bernstein. Um, but she said that she told me that she gave a talk to some adults and she said, oh, well, write down uh, a time when you were encouraged at school and write time at, down a time when you were discouraged. I don't remember the exact figures, but I think it was almost 90 percent of the people couldn't think of a time they were encouraged in school. Of course. And there is a fundamental flaw. I mean, I know that I learn things when I'm encouraged to learn them. And I know that it, when I think somebody's looking over my shoulder to tell me off, that it, it's harder for me to register and remember information. But our school system, and I think it is getting better. I think, you know, when I was a kid, you could still be uh, thrashed with the cane, mm. uh, and uh, which did happen to me, I admit it. And I didn't enjoy it. You know, I mean, all of this BDSM stuff, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> you know, I think the guy who hit me did. but um, Yeah, well, yeah, definitely, right? <laughs> not my kind of thing, really. But then, you know, my ki- my older children, who are uh, 29 and 32, they, they went to school where they were still shouted at. And my younger children who are in their teens, that really doesn't happen very much anymore. So I think... You know, things have got better, but but that idea of sitting somebody down and saying, you've done a really good job of this. And that and and it does happen in, you know, in my kids schools now, my younger kids, the teachers do tell them they're really good at things. And um, that's very reassuring. But if somebody, you know, somebody can get control of you and they can be the source of admiration for you that. You know, you don't care what anybody else thinks. You only care what this person thinks about you. Then you're into a guru relationship. You're into a potentially very dangerous relationship. What we're seeking to do at Open Minds is very much to um, encourage autonomy in people. So rather than you know selling them my ideas, um, selling them the idea of having their own ideas and being able to pick and mix sort between thoughts um rather than yeah i did an interview i did an interview with um uh, roger nygaard and um he, he, he went into a documentary uh called the nature of existence which is well worth watching uh, roger went around the world and he interviewed 200 people uh nuclear physicists uh psychologists neurologists um religious people about the nature of existence so he went to Jerusalem and talked to rabbis. He went to the Vatican. He went to um, India to talk to gurus. He went to Taiwan to talk to Taoist masters. And he came to England to talk to me and Richard Dawkins. Um, <laughs> but he'd got this, he'd been doing this for a couple of years by this time. And he got this uh, list of questions that took about three hours to answer. And, uh, you know, I stood there in Regent's Park without a break. I mean, talk about being in a cult group. <laughs> Three hours talking. But he asked the same questions. And so we got to the end, and that evening we went to have dinner, and one of his friends said to him, how did the interview go? And, and he said, well, I think if you asked the other cameraman, um, that he'd say it was the most interesting interview we'd done. He said, uh, because within five minutes of starting these questions, now I'm so used to it, I know everything that people will say. You know, once they've said no to this question, I know what all their other ones. This guy, no. <laughs> yeah, mm. the answers are all over. The place. And I, I'm not sure, you know, that's necessarily a good thing. But um, I, I'm very pleased with that, with the thought that, you know, while my, I, my answers might not be sensible necessarily, they are different, that, that I've thought about it. And that's what we want to encourage, the autonomy in in thinking so that so that people can go no hang on a minute i i want to go away and and think about that and um check other sources about that and see what's you know what's going on and by adding to that you know the the tricks of propaganda i'm I'm working on a piece at the moment um i was going to do a, a little course about fake news last year 
and things got in the way. You know how to spot fake news. And um, I went back to the... Do, do you know anything about the Institute of Propaganda Analysis? No. It's this wonderful organization that existed in the United States uh, for a brief period in the late 30s. It was closed down in 1941 or early 42 because you don't really want people understanding what propaganda right. is if you're fighting a war. And sadly, it never came back. But during its brief incarnation, there was a, they wrote a list of, I think it's seven points of how to spot propaganda. So I looked at that and I've, I've read a lot about propaganda and PR. I think it, you know, it's an integral part of this whole problem. You know, it's not just about cults. It's about gangs. It's about selling. It's about um, advertising. It's about spin. It's about the lies that politicians tell. It's all part of the persuasion arena. So, and it's all relevant because every part of it relates to every other part. So, I sort of looked at this and I thought, well, you know, this is still the best thing I've seen. You know, in 1939 they wrote this, and it's still. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll write to Anthony Prakarnis. Um, Anthony Prakarnis is on our advisory board. He's the co-author of Age of Propaganda, which is just a must-read book. Um, it's in its fourth or fifth edition by now. Um, just amazing when you get into what people have done over the years. You know to to con and trick us. Um, he's also, I believe, the editor of Influence magazine. So I thought, you know, I'm onto a winner here. I'll send him this thing saying, I'm thinking of doing this. And he'll laugh at me and say, don't be so ridiculous. Use something modern and up to date. Mm. But he didn't. He came back and I think it was a single word. I think he just said, fantastic. <laughs> uh, because, you know, there it is. It's out there, this information. You know, they start with the first point is glittering generalities. You know, when, you know, just these statements about how wonderful something will be that you can't actually put your finger on. It doesn't actually, you know, tell you anything. Um, so, I mean, bringing those, bringing together the available material, the idea at the moment with, with open minds, we started as a group of people um, wanting to bring people from other disciplines. There are a few of us who'd had experience of, helping cult members to recover and certainly the first the front end of that which is very often exit counseling where you're sitting down with a fanatically convinced member of an organization we the few of us that were foolish enough to do this learned how to talk to fanatics and how in a single day without any you know the door was never closed there was never any threat or coercion, there were no hypnotic techniques used, how to just use reasoning and an excellent document collection to persuade somebody to reconsider their involvement. And you know, I'm happy to say that everybody who was willing to talk to me, because a couple weren't, um, actually did reconsider their involvement and, and withdraw from the cult. Um, but I realised that that, that we had techniques that you could use to de-radicalize um, people who'd been tricked into one of these extreme uh, Salafi or Habi groups um, like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, whatever we're going to call mm -hmm. it this week. Um, and so that started me reading a lot about terrorism and I found that, that there was nobody in that world who wanted to talk to me. Um, so I kept on reading and kept on reading and, and realizing that, that these ideas spread everywhere. So the first idea was to bring together experts from different fields so that we could talk to each other. So we have counselors. Um, we, we have social psychology professors. Um, we, we have a variety of academics who've worked around cults. Um, and we have contact with people who've been involved with human trafficking. Uh, we have a significant interest in pedophile grooming um, because several of our uh, principals are former Jehovah's Witnesses. And, um, you know, the scandal. Huge scandal, yeah. 
it is, there's supposed to be a list of 23,000 names of pedophiles that is held secret by the Watchtower Society. And the horror is that they actually recruited in prisons and they recruited pedophiles who were then given positions where they had access to children with, with, without being monitored. The innocence, the naivety of this is just unbelievable. Um, so we, we've actually got a, um, a sizable piece of work that, that my assistant Spike drew up and that I've edited, which is, you know, how to see pedophile grooming, you know, the steps, what is going on there and how it's done. Um, but so we're looking at influence wherever it is and we find the same things in common, you know, which is the point of opening minds, the book that if you look at an abusive relationship, it's an abusive relationship, whether it's, you know, a single person bullying their partner or whether it's, uh, you know, Stalin and the communist party that, mm. There, the dynamics are there uh, that, that form a cultic relationship, a disorganized attachment, and something that is highly dangerous to the world. Um, I believe with Aaron Beck, the um, founder of cognitive therapy, that if that, that warfare is an outgrowth of individual animosity, that where people cannot resolve their differences through negotiation, they will escalate to conflict. And looking at the way that's happened, you know, over the many centuries, that wars that were fought, you know, one of my own fav favourites is the War of Jenkinson's Ear, which I think was fought with between the British and the Dutch. <laughs> um, over Jenkinson's Ear, apparently, you know. And um, I don't think it helped Jenkinson in any way, fighting war. Um, we, we see people, we see too much rage in our society um, and we see, you know, too much contempt. You know, one of the um, ways of manipulating people is through aversion or disgust. Um, it's not been talked about enough in the countercult world. We talk about phobia inductions and we talk about guilt inductions. So what, what you were saying earlier about the perception of Arabs and Muslims in the US at the moment, that's a phobia induction. It's not based upon fact and reality. The, the majority of Muslims, the vast majority of Muslims are law abiding citizens who support the state they're in uh, without getting into the niceties of, of what Dar al-Islam means. Um, the U.S. has never been a Muslim country as such, so it has nothing to worry about about being colonized. Um, but aversion, you know, just that, that thing that we apparently we develop it when we're about three or four months old. Um, it's meant to be related to the insular area of the brain, which is just below the temporal lobe to the side. And what happens if you put a, a three months old by something stinky, it will crawl towards it. Past that age, a little past that age, it'll crawl away from it. So we recognize certain smells as being distasteful. They, they represent something that's rotten, something that's horrible. And so, you know, it, it could possibly carry disease. It could be bad for us. We then have aversions of taste. And I think that somehow this whole process is hijacked and you can see it. If you mention the name of, um, wow, I'm going to get political. If you mention Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump yeah. <laughs> to Americans, on one of those names, their nose will wrinkle and their lips will wrinkle, showing disgust. Very often, very often. And it's interesting seeing that kind of automatic response. Um, if we then take it to its extreme, that is the genocidal response. That is, in, in every genocide that, that I've been able to look at, and there are quite a few, sadly, um, 
the people who are being murdered are reduced to the state of vermin. So the Nazis called the Jews and the Roma people uh, fleas or rats. They were non-human in the same way that the slaves, the black African slaves, were considered non-human. They were a variety of ape, according to you know, eminent anthropologists in the early 20th century were still putting this view forward that there were different races, which is why we have this word racism. There aren't any different races. There's just one race of human beings. We're all black. Some of us are just a slightly lighter black than the rest. <laughs> um, I wonder if that will get me any comments. But, oh, I'm, I'm sure it will. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the, the, so if you can stimulate disgust, and you see it when you go to meetings. I, you know, I went to, um, as a teenager, I went to a Christadelphian meeting, and they were really nice people. Um, but, it, you know, I, I was just curious about it. Oh, it got me in trouble in the end. But I was curious about all of these little groups. You know, I went to a Catholic church and a Methodist church, and I went and talked with the ministers afterwards. Christadelphians don't have any ministers. Um, they don't use symbols. They, you know, there's no cross. Uh, one of them goes up and reads from the Bible. But while I was there, one of them mentioned Darwin and monkeys. And it was fascinating seeing the whole room erupt into laughter about the idea of evolution. And seeing how a group, you know, takes its prejudices and will then have disgust or aversion towards anybody that doesn't share those beliefs. Which is kind of small minded, really. Um, you know, I, I accept that we all have a right to our own metaphor for the universe. And so I, you know, I have no problem talking with Christians, Buddhists, Jews, atheists, anybody. And I have no problem in my own position, which is I'm an agnostic. I have no idea what is going on mm. or who's doing it. I just wish sometimes they'd stop. Um, but uh, to me, that these are all wonderful, fascinating. You know, the Australian notions of the dream time and the song lines. This is just beautiful stuff. The idea that before you kill an animal, you should um, sacrifice something to its ancestor so that it would be all right for you to take it. These, these are all beautiful, poetic ideas. And people get astonishingly angry about them. You know, it, it's, it's my religion. It's my form of my religion. And if you say anything about it, then you're evil. Rather than the more open idea of, well, uh, what would you like to say about it and can we talk about it you know can, can we under, you know which was the mistake i made with the born again who walked mm. away i thought he'd be curious to talk and he, he basically probably had a weekly quota of converts to make and i wasn't exactly there. i don't know poor man would john would you then say that i mean of the the sort of aversion or or uh you know i mean this uh instantly my brain started thinking of uh, you know, like far right, like the white power movement obviously uses aversion to virtually everybody that's not, uh, you know, white Protestant born in America, um, you know, in order to recruit uh, amongst their ranks. And certainly the white power movement has become more and more kind of culty, um, you know, in in its uh, – I mean, there is almost nothing uh, really all that political about them anymore. Um, you know, not that I agree with their politics of the past, but at least they, uh, they, they did present something. Now they are essentially just a, uh, you know, a white power cult. But, yeah. you know, the, the, the issue of aversion almost seems to, um, kind of like, it goes beyond that. It's not just about racial groups or anything like that, or, you know, recruiting, uh, to, uh, even, you know, to say like a terrorist group. Obviously, you know, you talked about Al Qaeda. I mean, in the book, Opening Minds, you talk quite a bit about um, his uh, Ut Tahir, uh, which is a very bizarre, strange cult that operates worldwide still to this day, yeah. um, and uh, has uh, you know, and they people associated with them have a, connections with Al Mujahirun, which is another sort of pseudo cult slash uh, you know proxy force and it's got all sorts of strange connections to MI5 and, and others and uh, and has long sort of manipulated young Muslim men in the UK um, you know all those I, I understand you know the aversion 
certainly appeals to to all that. But I mean, you can almost see that you know aversion is again in this sort of sense. I know that it sounds so sort of scary that we're 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 lo- we're constantly living in a cult. You know, aversion is used for everything, yeah. you know, especially today. Uh, the the sort of um, you know the the kind of the political climate or the social climate or what have you. You know, it's all it's not about what do we agree on. You know, it's it's what do we what do we mutually hate? Yeah, you know what um, uh, you know what what do we both hate? Let's build upon that. You know, it, it's it you know I mean you I'm sure even in over in the UK I mean you've seen you know the the endless endless debates here about the Second Amendment. You know, and it's it's no longer even about you know we support the Second Amendment. It's we hate those people that oppose it. We hate them to such a degree that that, you know, that's what unites us is our hate. And um, I guess my question to you, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that, that just seems to have such a negative impact on us. Um, And, you know, again, I wonder if that doesn't, again, make us more susceptible to uh, getting involved in these sort of toxic relationships. Um, And and just again, too, I mean, um, you know, the, the sort of psychic trauma that that causes to be that angry all the time. Um, that's got to have an impact on you, right, John? Absolutely. And, and I think, it, you know, if we take a historical aside and, and look at the foundation of the uh, clan circle, the Ku Klux Klan, mm. that if you look at that, that period in American history, which, which as far as I understand is not much spoken about in school history books, the period of Reconstruction, that you have Confederate soldiers who've returned from a war that they believed in, and they've been defeated. They return to a ravaged country because Sherman has burned his way through. Mm-hmm. They're told they no longer have the vote. Um, they're told all of the slaves have been released uh, and that they do have the vote. And there are troops in blue uniforms watching everybody. So a group of people who, you know, they they felt that what they were doing was right. And they felt they were protecting their homeland. They, you know, the issue of slavery is can be debated every which way. But they believed they were protecting their home right, their homeland and their, their way of life. They come back having lost everything. And they're embittered. And there's the foundation for any, you know, group like Al Qaeda um, or the contemporary Aryan Brotherhood, say, Mm. that there's a bitterness. There's a sense that there are privileged people who've been given everything and and believe themselves entitled. And, you know, they'll form their own cults because they feel (laughs) other things about, you know, not having been entitled enough. But then there are many, many people struggling. And when you look at you know, meetings of clan type organizations, particularly in the southern, southern states, you see regular people, you see ordinary people having a barbecue mm-hmm. and getting upset about ideas that separate them from other people. You know, we, we talked about the notion of, you know, loving your country earlier on and patriotism. Well, they they love the white bit of their country, you know. They yes. love the the rednecks or you know whatever term we want to use that belong to their community. And there is always that danger. If you know, if you look back to say Rome, when during the chariot races there were two teams and they each had their fanatical supporters, and there were times when those supporters went wild and sacked the whole city. You know? um, they served more, they, they did more damage than the vandals did indeed. Um, but they're these kind of swarms, these packs of human beings driven by hatred, driven by their, their, a sense of fervor in what they believe. If you look at the way the Nazis were able to go through Eastern Europe and to persuade local people to kill the Jews among them. There's film, you know, for the conspiracy theorists out there, there is film of a group of um, Eastern European peasants being given uh, scaffolding bars and beating to death 
the local jury. And in an interview many years later, in a BBC documentary called The Nazis, A Warning from History, one of the men who was involved in the killing speaks out. And he says, we went to school with them. We grew up with them. We went and helped them with their harvest. They came and helped with our harvest. And then the Nazis came and we killed them. And you get the way that this contagious hatred can suddenly move into a people, this, this sense of belonging to something greater than yourself. And the truth is we are atomized individuals. And while we should be supportive of our families and our communities, we should remember that we are individuals. And for me, relish challenges to our, our thinking, to our beliefs, things that we can you know, go away and consider. And the xenophobia, the, the hatred of the stranger, you know, ah, the, everywhere in the world, these cliques and clacks, these people are setting themselves up to be other than and different from, you know, neoconservatives and neoliberals, all of these strange groups who have mighty self-interest at the heart of much of what they do, who are predatory in their approach to the world. You know, all of these super rich people who are, you know, deciding what to do with the money they should have paid in taxes, as Warren mm. Buffett recently pointed out. That you know, you get the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation because the tax system didn't take enough money from them, you know. Mm. And and they get to and Zuckerberg and what have you, they get to have power in the world, which must be very nice for them. And it's great where good is being done. But um I would rather see a, a world where we care about all other human beings. You know, as Charlie Chaplin said, he was a patriot of the whole world. Well, I'm a patriot of all of humanity and all that surrounds us. The idea that, you know, it'd be good for us to go and kill some people in some part of the world to protect ourselves does not make sense to me. Um, and I tend to think that Al-Qaeda could probably have been dealt with rather swiftly uh, if you know, notice had been taken of what they were doing. Very interested to watch the first few episodes of The Looming Tower, speaking of which. Have you, have you tuned in? I have not seen it. I, I probably will be watching it at some point um, do. and uh, do. Uh, covering it on the show. Because, um, yeah. you know, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's fascinating that they're doing The Looming Tower now of all times. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's it's funny, John, you, you mentioned this sort of at the very beginning, I think, of the conversation. Um, <clears throat> talking about the, you know, yet again, we're, we seem to be kind of like on the upswing again of, of Islamic terrorism. You know, it, it, it ebbs and flows so much. And I think it's, it's since 9-11, at least, um, it's become so kind of ubiquitous uh, within our society that we're, we're sort of conditioned to just sort of accept it. You know, um, yeah. I mean, for the, the Manchester bombing, where you are, um, in England, I mean, that was, yep. you know, oh. and that was one of a string. There was the, the um, what was it, the... the um, Westminster Bridge incident. Westminster Bridge. There was the incident yeah. on the on the train just outside of London with a, uh, you know, a sort of failed bomb went off. Uh, and it's just sort of, it's so like ingrained into our minds that this is just sort of part of life. And it, it's funny that, you know, and it, it just sort of fades into the background and then suddenly all, all you know, all of a sudden again, this uh, aversion, this hatred of jihadis, you know, it kind of pops up always at these opportune moments. And we seem to be kind of back to that again, you know, the threat of ISIS. Um, you know, if you follow a lot of the, the more sort of neoconservative think tanks and stuff, you know, they, they keep telling us that Al Qaeda is about to make another big splash. We, we're not done with it yet. Um, you know, we, we must be aware of it. So I, I find it interesting um, that, you know, so many years later, we're getting uh, the looming tower, um, you know, yeah. is coming out right now. So, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know if there was a, a question or anything in there for you. <laughs> but um, I'm sure I can find something to poke at. <laughs> um, yeah. It, and the scale of it is is fascinating that that if you look at you know, since the late 1960s, you know, from the late 1967 to 1999, I lived in a country that was under constant attack by the provisional Irish Republican Army. Um, 
we had bombings where as many as 200 people were harmed. Um, and you just accepted that if you went into a bar, you know, it might be blown up. Um, they, they worked on a much larger scale than any of um, the British-based Islamist groups um, did far more damage. Um, and in the end, Tony Blair said, uh, well, with these people in the end, you know, you've got to talk to them, which was about two weeks before he went into Iraq. So obviously he kept the compartments <laughs> in his mind functioning. But the US too has, has lived with terrorism. I have in front of me a, a list. Um, in, in 1972, there were 1,962 actual and attempted bombings in the United States mm. with 25 people killed. In 1973, 1,955 bombings with 22 killed. In 1974, 2,044 bombings with 24 killed. Now, I would suggest that the main change is not in the quantity of terrorism, but in the media reporting. And I think the same is true for school shootings, that the American Psychological Association keeps begging the media not to report school shootings. Now, where I live in the last five years, there have been no school shootings. Where you live, there have been 200. There was just one today in Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, you know, when you know what you know about copycat mm. and those phenomena that it does make it rather worrying but there is something you know we are subjected to dreadful events and it it's important to keep the statistics there how many people die on the roads how many people die from breathing in soot soot is actually killing far more people in the united states than al-qaeda is it's killing probably about a hundred thousand people a year soot just little particles in the air. Um, the, getting some balance and realizing that the, what's happened is that we've had phobia induced. We, we've been, you know, a friend of mine was down in London on the 7-7 the, uh, seven, seven bombings in 2005, and he didn't ever want to go on the underground again. He didn't ever want to catch a bus again. After 9-11, people didn't want to catch planes. And so, of course, road deaths went up by, what was it, 6,000 people in the US that next yeah. year? So we are very emotionally tuned. You know, when something seems threatening to us, then our aversion develops and we push it away. When, you understand, when we understand that the Salafi or Wahhabi congregation of the Sunni Muslims represents about half a percent of all Muslims, and that indeed that is much of Saudi Arabia and that most of those Salafis are peaceful. You have this tiny amount of people, and that's Al-Qaeda. They're originally, I think, 479 people. You know, when 9-11 happened, that was the total for the four groups that were mistakenly lumped together as the base, Al-Qaeda. Two of them were intimately connected, the Sudan and the Afghanistan groups, but um, the group in North Africa, in the Maghreb, and, and the group in... Uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, they're not really part of Al-Qaeda. So, but even if you added them in 479 people, once the Iraq invasion was underway, that had gone up to about 35,000 people. What we are now calling ISIS used to be called the Republican Guard. So the reason they were so successful so quickly in Syria is because they're professional soldiers. They're not terrorists. They're not. They're people who lost their jobs when the country was invaded, were not allowed to re-enlist because they were Sunnis and have no political say in that country. There's not a single Sunni representative in the government, though 40% of the people are Sunnis. So what came out of that was an army that went about and, and got itself under the command of this guy Baghdadi, who is completely insane. <laughs> and they began to commit atrocities and, you know, created this hell on earth in Syria. You know, and the, now the, the war between the Turks and the Kurds has erupted again. And 
you know, we don't, um, it's hard to know which side anybody's on anymore, really, with, with all of the factions fighting there. But this was a manufactured conflict. This is something that was propaganda. Hearts and minds was used so hard to make this happen. I mean, um, Nancy Snow wrote about the, you know, the creation of the propaganda machine to, to make this happen uh, in George W. Bush's administration. And it, it's just terrifying to realize that politicians believe they have the right to lie to us. They believe they have the right to spin information, you know, to put out a, a sexy news story to cover over something, you know, damaging that might be said about them. But this is considered somehow ethical and proper. You know, the, the Greeks in, in Athens, at the end of your political term, you went on trial to <laughs> see if what you'd done was good. And, and I think we should have a bit more of that personally, that at least a kind of truth and reconciliation process where, um, you know, it can be opened out because I fear that what's happened is that, that politics has become pretty much corrupt, that, that people are doing things because of the lobbyists not because of the needs of the people, um, you know, or because of the super rich, not because of the needs of the people. Mm. Um, and I think, well, I think that that's possible. completely superseded. Um, you know, I, I, I would, I would argue politics has always been corrupt, but the level to which the kind of corruption now operates again, it's ubiquitous within our society. We yeah. almost kind of just accept it. And, and in many ways expect it to happen. Um, yeah. Be it voting irregularities with an electronic voting machine, um, which happens in almost every single election here in the U.S. Mm. So, you know, just imagine in, in countries we don't like um, or, or in countries that we do like, uh, you know, where yeah. they win by 95 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that that's just kind of normal. I mean, the. um I guess we're, we're kind of getting a bit more of a taste. I, I mean, I feel like on, on some level, um, you know, the, the sex scandals in, in the UK have been, you know, they, they've become a, a bit more kind of accepted or part of the, the political sort of milieu. I mean, the, the sort of more tawdry headlines, um, you know, a lot of the um, British publication, you know, like the Sun or the Mirror or the Daily Mail. I mean, they've always covered politics in a, in a sort of, inter you know, gossipy scandal sort of way. We're now seeing that here where, I mean, you know, we, we it's headline news to know about, um, you know, uh, Donald Trump's relationship with porn star Stormy Daniels with mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s affair with some, you know, contestant on The Apprentice while he was married. Um, you know, it, and it's just sort of par for the course, um, you know, not to mention the sort of uh, overarching corruption that's just sort of going on. I mean, especially, I mean, the current administration, you basically just have, you know, um, most of the important uh, federal agencies being run um, by, you know, uh, lobbyists or, uh, you know, arms dealers, you know, arms right. manufacturers. Of industry, yeah. Um, and, I mean, sexual scandals were something that were, were sort of brushed aside. I mean, when Lloyd George was prime minister during World War One, the media would never mention his mistresses. Um, of course, FDR got away with the same. JFK got away with the same. George, um, Bill Clinton nearly got away with it. Um, not, he, he did pretty much get away with it. I think. Oh yeah, I mean he's got away with it. I mean yeah, I mean he's he's still sort of admired for that in in a, in a disgusting kind of a way. Yeah, and, and it indicates a, a narcissistic personality type, a predatory person that, that they feel they should have the right to do that. Um, it, I mean, it, and it's in, you know, it's interesting. I, I think in, you know, if you look to French politics, that uh, you find that again, that they're likely to congratulate the guy on, you know, managing to keep mistresses. Mm. Uh, and I think it's curious because as long as it's in the open, as long as people do know about it, there is no corruption. It, it's when it's something that somebody can be blackmailed over that becomes corrupt. And um, it, I th there are levels of com corruption, aren't there? You know, there's the backsheesh where you have to pay every everybody you meet. Right, you know, right. You know, some some of the Arab countries to, to get anywhere at all. Or, or in, in Russia, I've heard similar things. Um through to the kind of Tammany Hall 
scandals of rigged elections in the US in the 30s, which of course FDR was part of. Um, <laughs> but the, the idea of politicians working for anybody but their constituents, uh, that, that they can, you know, take, take so much money, you know, $200,000 to speak at, 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 at a, some kind of, kind of industrial meeting or um, for the MEK. I'm sorry? Or for the MEK. Yeah, or for the MEK, yeah. <laughs> that, that, I, I don't know. That, that I think our political life is, is corrupted. And I think that understanding the spin, understanding the propaganda, the influence that's used, um, and yes, there is a chapter in my book about that too. Um, and we will be putting more material onto our website. Understanding that helps us to challenge it and helps us pos potentially to change it and to demand a more just society, a society where we do have equal rights, you know, where the rich or, or the or white men or, you know, there are no groups that, mm. that, that have special preference in this system and and i think it also i mean if you look at the police culture almost wherever you go a group of people who work together will have loyalty for one another but this becomes ridiculous when policemen are actually covering up for one another you know there was a situation many years ago in the uk where a young black man was beaten very severely and they knew that six police officers had done it. That night, there were 18 police, police officers on duty. And the other 12, would none of them testify that it wasn't them? Yeah. You know, the, the solidarity. And I, that kind of makes me cringe that, that you have to represent honesty and the truth, justice and the people, not your own little group within it. But, you know, cults form and, and people believe that they can do immoral and dishonest things because of the group they belong to. You know, so where in Australia, 8,000 children were abused by 500 priests. And you kind of go, this is bigger than an apology and this is bigger than paying damages. You know, that, yeah. that the organiza an organization that conceals the harm it's doing so that you won't think it's doing harm, you know, I, I have a little bit of a problem with that. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm, and like you said, I mean, it goes beyond. It's not just an apology. I mean, that's the least of uh, you know <laughs> what they can. You know, that's just the bare minimum uh, for mm -hmm. what they can do. Um, and uh, John, we we are running out of time, um, and I just wanted you to uh, once again uh, direct people uh, to where they can go to learn uh, more about this. Of course, the Open Minds Foundation. And your books, and and briefly, we'll just um we'll just mention that uh, John and I are going to be doing uh, a a podcast for Open Minds, um hopefully starting in the very near future. We've got a lot of guests lined up, and uh, both of us are very excited about that. So, uh, John, just uh, once again, uh, tell everybody where they can go uh, to um uh, check out your work and to check out the stuff that's going on at Open Minds. Well, the Open Minds Foundation dot org. Um, and as you say, we we hopefully perhaps next month we, yeah, we will absolutely. Start, start doing a monthly show, um, interviewing some of the people at Open Minds, so that people can, you know, get to know us and 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 see yeah you know, what what they can do. Because I mean, the thing is that we can help people to safeguard their kids from bullying, from things like that, from pedophile grooming. We can help people to safeguard their friends from cult involvement for you know, radicalization, these sort of things, and from getting into abusive relationships. There's a lot of simple, straightforward information here. It's free of charge. Very happy if you want to make a donation, but the, the idea is to make the information fully available. And it's life-changing. Believe me, if I'd known, you know, when I was 19, what I know now, my life would have been a great deal easier. And I'm hoping that we can pass that over to some, some people. Absolutely. So uh, once again, John Atak has been my guest. Thank you so much. If you want to uh, support my work, if you liked what you heard, then please remember to go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redmond. And uh, lots of uh, interesting guests on the horizon, of course. John and I will be talking very soon on our new show. Uh, but until then, I will be talking to you all very soon.
No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our stringent quality controls and absolute zero GMOs plus testing for heavy metals makes us unique in the storable foods market. Our line of fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Take out the amount you need and reseal the package for use within the next six months. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's www.simplycleanfoods.net today. This is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high food dose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, (laughs) you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company, which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. Assassination. You know what's interesting about assassination? Well, not only does it change those popularity polls in a big hurry, but it's also interesting to notice who it is we assassinate. Do you ever notice who it is? Stop to think of who it is we kill. It's always people who've told us to live together in harmony and try to love one another. Jesus, Gandhi, Lincoln, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John Lennon. They all said, try to live together peacefully. Bam! Right in the head. Apparently, we're not ready for that. Yeah, that's difficult behavior for us. We're too busy thinking around, sitting around trying to think up ways to kill each other. Here's one we came up with. It's efficient, too. Genocide. You know? Killing large numbers of people simply because they don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they don't have the same kind of hats you do. (laughs) You ever notice that anytime you see two groups of people who really hate each other, chances are good they're wearing different kind of hats. (laughs) Keep an eye on that. It might be important. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom, and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs, and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Need to trouble the all out. Control is good. Five, right to Prepare your mind to experience American Freedom Radio. 